All right. Let's see. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. All right, let me know when I can get started. I'd say you're probably good now, five after. Yeah. They can always okay. catch the recording, so sure. appreciate yeah. your time. Oh, no problem. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I've kind of, I've been able to log in a few times to some of the lectures that have been done. So um, I'm really glad to kind of join in on this effort to improve um, EP um, education in Nigeria. Um, and particularly on a more advanced level. So um, I've given this lecture a couple of times. Um, as you guys know, I'm part of the Cardiovascular Education Foundation, and um, we typically will give a board review every year. We usually will talk about the basics of some arrhythmias. So I went a little bit more in detail um, in this lecture. Um, so please feel free to answer, um, to ask any questions that you have and um, I will answer to the best of my ability. So thank you again for having me. Um, so the first thing we're talking about atrial fibrillation, um, I bring up this picture of the New York Times because um, you know, when, health, um, when health diseases reach the New York Times, it seems like it's kind of reached prime time. And um, we have a lot of patients who then ask us, oh, do I have this? Is there something going on? What can we do to treat that? Um, with the New York Times article, the Apple watches that basically tell you if you're in atrial fibrillation or not, um, AFib is kind of come, getting to a resurgence. And so um, treatment of atrial fibrillation, what exactly it means is coming into the public lexicon. And that's you know in the United States as well as abroad. So what I want to do is talk about the history of atrial fibrillation and the history of atrial fibrillation ablation, um, explore some of the pathophysiology of that, and basically talk about where we are now. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So like I tell people, I'm not important enough to have any disclosures at this point. Um, as usual, for anybody who's kind of been to a lecture that I give, or any presentation I give, I like to bring it back to the patient. So I'm going to talk about Miss JS, who's a patient of mine. Um, and you know, she, I was called to the emergency room to see her. She came in with complaints of palpitations. She said that she occasionally feels dizzy, um, and she usually would have chest pain with these palpitations. And after so long of having these palpitations, she decided to come to the emergency room. And um, her EKG shows an irregular tachycardia. So um, this is her EKG. And as you can see, there are a couple of things that um, you should note once you look at the EKG. The first thing is um, that we don't see any P waves. We don't actually see any discernible P waves. Um, and the second thing that you should also notice is that it's irregular. But not only is it irregular, it's irregularly irregular, which is, you know, the once you say irregularly irregular, that means that you're talking about atrial fibrillation. So, um, you know, Miss JS has atrial fib. Um, so then the question now becomes, okay, what do we do about it? Um, well, the first thing that we did was um, get an echocardiogram, and you know this was an echo. She's she's new. She's not new to the hospital system, so she had an echocardiogram previously. Um, and you know, whereas her echo previously did show some mild left atrial dilatation, now it shows severe left atrial dilatation. Um, so that makes us think, okay, this is becoming a little bit more um, than she had previously as well. So the um, her, the amount of AFib she's having is a little bit more. So what do we want to do for it? Well, we know that atrial fibrillation is this chaotic movement of um, electrical signals in the heart. 
Um, and I don't know if this projects very well or how well you're able to see it, but these white dots are supposed to be, um, you know, where typically you would have this synchronized electrical movement that will come from the septum into the left side. Here you just see kind of this chaotic movement of electrical signals that seem to be coming from everywhere, right? And that's typically what you will see in AFib. So what are the things that contribute to you having atrial fibrillation? Well, um, it could be as a result of genetics, right? So in a lot of cases, we've seen uh, patients who will start off really young um, and they'll have AFib and they'll say, oh, my parents had it, you know, um, and it also goes with heart failure and other um, heart diseases. So there's that. But more often, it comes from other conditions that increase the amount of um, pressure that is in the atrium. So obesity, heart failure, high blood pressure is a big thing. Um, unfortunately, the older and wiser you get, you also gain one more thing, which is atrial fibrillation. So if you're above 70 years old, then the amount of folks with atrial fibrillation is about 20%. If you um, are above 80 years old, it increases more to about 40%. And then diabetes, the same way that it spoils everything, it also um, spoils your heart and can cause atrial fibrillation as well. And so why do we care? Well, we care because AFib can lead to stroke, right? And then also atrial fibrillation can also lead to heart failure. So there is a lot of, um, a lot of um, pressure to see what we can do for AFib and if we can um, get rid of it or at least stop the progression to heart failure and decrease the chances of stroke as both of these conditions um, contrib contribute a lot to mortality and morbidity of patients. So um, AFib has been described from a long time ago and actually Sir James McKenzie who came from, you know, from England back in the day um, in 1905, um, this was a statement that he said. So he said, of such forms of heart failure, there is one to which I have been giving special attention for many years and the treatment of which has been unsatisfactory. This form includes many of those cases of heart failure with an enlargement of the organ and a continued irregularity of its action, often without any antecedent history of valvular affectation and in whom postmortem examination reveals no structural changes in the valves. So he was describing AFib and that was as early as 1905. So that's amazing, right? Um, so he took the way that he was able to describe this and know this is that he noticed that, oh, with the um, irregularity, sometimes you would have a change in the pulse. So he um, took simultaneous tracings of the juggler and radial pulses. And um, when the radial pulse was irregular, um, the juggler pulse um, waves were changed from where they were before. And the worse they got and the faster they got, then also your um, radio pulse even became even worse. So this told you that, well, if it's rapid, if it's faster, the more irregular it was, um, your cardiac output was also affected. So this went on for a long time, and it wasn't actually until the 1990s where um, Hazegger, um, a physician from France, um, came up with the pulmonary vein theory because everybody was treating atrial fibrillation. We had atrial fibrillation ablation, surgical ablations, where we would just kind of cut off connection between the top and the bottom chambers of the heart um, and basically make a patient pacemaker dependent, but nobody really knew how to get rid of AFib. And so Hazegger um, did this study, very small study when you consider all the things that we do now, but in 45 patients with um, frequent episodes of AFib, what they found was that they could figure out from a single point of um, ectopic beats found in um, these patients, most of them had these ectopic beats coming from the left side and not only from the left side, but from the pulmonary veins. And so their thought was, well, if spontaneous initiation of AFib happened with ectopic beats 
coming from the pulmonary veins, then if we could isolate the pulmonary veins, then um, that would help. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, there has been atrial um, catheter ablation, which is basically the, um, the way that we get rid of cardiac tissue um, and conductive tissue um, by use of either heat or um, cold energy. Um, it was first described in the 1960s with mapping. So mapping is the act of, um, you know, figuring out um, electrical um, activation in the heart by use of catheters. Um, and the first human catheter ablation was described in 1982 by Scheinman. Um, Initially, we had all these things that had to happen before we could have endovascular um, ablation. Um, first of all, Mo came about um, the wavelet hypothesis, just basically saying that, hey, um, the way that we create electrical um, signals in the heart, if we're able to um, create them with if we're able to get rid of these abnormal electrical signals, then that will um, cure arrhythmia, right? And then Seeley um, came about with the surgical AV node ablation, which was used for treatment of um, atrial fibrillation. Um, and in this process, they also um, came up with um, the with um, ablations for or surgical ablations for um, WPW or ventricular pre-excitation. Um, in 1982, Scheinman, who is still alive in UCSF, um, he came up with endovascular AV node ablation, um, which is um, the way that we, which is where how we um, ablate patients today, where we use catheters that are from the groin. Um, and from the femoral vein all the way up into the heart and we're able to map and ablate at the same time. Um, and then in 1987, interestingly, um, Dr. Mays came up with the Mays procedure, which has been modified to be the Cox Mays procedure to get rid of atrial fibrillation. Um, and the idea is that if we're able to, or what they found was if they were able to um, dissect into the atrium. So basically what they would do is take the atrium, make some cuts in it um, in order to isolate this, these wavelets that Mo talked about um, and you sew them back together, um, you basically could prevent atrial fibrillation from happening. So um, the way that we treat atrial fibrillation has kind of grown from all of those theories to the way that it is now. Um, we have different types of patients, right, who have AFib. So our treatment for all these different patients varies, right? So for a 65-year-old man who comes in with a history of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes, and occasional fatigue, right, that's some age and has an EKG that shows you atrial fibrillation. That's one patient, and that's you know the more common patient that we see. But um, when you have okay, twenty-five year old woman, severe palpitations, um, post-hospital visit on metoprolol, says that she feels drained from taking um, metoprolol. You know that's another type of patient. She's really young. You know, so you might think to yourself, well, is medication the way to go? What should we do? Um, and then you can have patients who have AFib as a result of something else, right? So this person who has atrial fibrillation um, had a diagnosis of obstructive aortic stenosis, their post an aortic valve replacement, otherwise doesn't have any other prime medical history. Um, and then how about this patient who um, has 45-year-old, um, has a history of COVID, that's supposed to be COVID-19, sorry, it's not COVID-10. It's not a new COVID out there, um, but basically has shortness of breath, fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance. So, you know, you have all these patients, one patient is more chronic, another person that has more um, palpitations, you know, how would you approach any of these patients to decide how you're going to treat AFib? Is it by medications? Would you want to run to do, you know, um, procedures on everyone? how would you approach the patient? 
the first question that you should ask yourself is what kind of atrial fibrillation is it, right? So there are different types of AFib. Um, we usually will say, okay, you have paroxysmal, persistent, longstanding, persistent. Those are the three that form the core classifications of AFib. The first time you see AFib, we usually say, okay, this is the first diagnosis. The reason why you don't want to say whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, I mean, it's obviously not persistent, but you might not say that it's paroxysmal, just depending on um, the context in which you found the atrial fibrillation. I'll give you an example. If you have a patient who had surgery, um, whether it's cardiac or non-cardiac, maybe a thoracic surgery, we know that these patients who are in surgery because of the high stress of surgery, um, that high adrenergic tone, that can increase your chances of having AFib. Does that mean we should treat that atrial fibrillation like all atrial fibrillation? It's not necessarily the case. There's some people who consider this to be similar to, um, let's say if you have a patient who's pregnant and shows up with high blood pressure, do we say that the person has high blood pressure or diabetes for the rest of their life? No, but we do know that if they have high blood pressure, if they have diabetes during pregnancy, it is a sign that they have a higher risk of having high blood pressure and diabetes later in life, but not necessarily at that time. So it's just something to watch out for. So there's some folks who will say, well, AFib that comes out as a result of surgery or certain illnesses such as COVID um, might be a sign that, hey, you're at higher risk for atrial fibrillation. You do have what's called the substrate of atrial fibrillation, which means you have conditions in your heart that, will, that can support atrial fibrillation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have that diagnosis. Um, so it's not, so you might not need to be on antiarrhythmic medication. You might not actually have to be on anticoagulation depending on your CHAZVAS score. Um, so there's that, right? So that's why we say, okay, the first time that you have atrial fibrillation, we really need to decide whether it's something that's more longstanding or whether it's not, because that has implications on treatment. So paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, more importantly, paroxysmal AFib, that's AFib that terminates spontaneously or with intervention within seven days of onset, period. If it's persistent, it lasts for longer than seven days. And if it has been longer than 12 months of continuous duration, um, then it's considered to be long-standing persistent. Um, most patients that I come in contact with um, might be in the persistent realm. Um, there are a few that end up being long-standing persistent because they've been rate controlled previously, but then they're still symptomatic. And so they come to me for further management. Um, there are a lot of folks who come in because they're very symptomatic when they're paroxysmal um, because their heart hasn't changed a lot as a result of the atrial fibrillation, so they feel all the symptoms. Um, and remember that permanent atrial fibrillation is not a condition of the heart itself, is more so a decision between the patient and their physician um, where they have decided that no further attempts to restore or maintain sinus rhythm will be undertaken. And now this patient is in atrial fibrillation forever. And so this is where we are. So the second thing that we have to consider is whether you would do rate control or rhythm control. A lot of um, cardiologists, well, a lot of folks who are not cardiac electrophysiologists will say that rate control and rhythm control, there's no real significant difference. Um, the methods that we use for rate control are your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers and DIG. Um, and for rhythm control, of course, there's ablation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then there's also medical rhythm control, which includes your antiarrhythmics, your flecainisodolol, amiodarone, dofetilide, ibutilide, right? Um, the reason why folks will say, well, rate control, rhythm control, it's kind of equal, um, all stems from this um, paper or this research trial that was done, um, published in 2002. And um, I will say that it's had a huge effect on um, a lot of um, trainees' um, thoughts of atrial fibrillation, unfortunately, um, because it's made us pretty accepting 
of um, rate control or the presence of atrial fibrillation without considering um, other, um, other factors. Now, what did Affirm do? So Affirm was a trial of antiarrhythmic drugs versus rate control medication. Um, and during this time, remember it was in 2002, but most of the patients were enrolled um, before 1999. So um, for rhythm control, they were cardioverting as necessary, or they were using amiodarone and other um, antiarrhythmics. And when dofedilai became available, they were also using that. Um, when they looked at the patients, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation, um, sinus rhythm in those patients went down from 82% to 63% at one, three, and five years. Um, and that's important to note. Um, they did have a lot of side effects, right? So with antiarrhythmic drugs, unfortunately, it becomes a lot of side effects, um, such as, you know, your PEAs, trossards, um, and also GI and pulmonary events, um, especially if you're using amiodarone, um, thyroid events, if you're using amio, those are things that you should consider. Um, with rate control, um, there is, um, you're using mainly your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers and DIG. Um, and at the end of the trial, actually 35% of the rate control arm was in sinus rhythm. Right, so that's important to note. So they compared these two arms, right? No ablation really. And what did they find? They said, well, if you did rhythm control versus rate control, there was really no survival benefit. But with rhythm control, you actually had, you know, increased risk of adverse drug effects, um, which you had less of during the rate control strategy. Um, the other thing, important thing, though, that came out of this trial was that, you know, for patients who were in the rhythm control arm, what folks were doing was they would take them off anticoagulation because they said, okay, you're in sinus rhythm, so we'll anticoagulate you for a little bit, but after that, we'll take you off. And those patients who were in the rate control arm, because no one's intention was for them to be rhythm controlled, they all stayed on anticoagulation. And what they found was that there was a significant difference in the amount of stroke between both groups. So another conclusion of the AFFIRM trial, which is less touted, was that anticoagulation should be continued in high-risk patients. So that's the reason why we, irrespective of whether the patient is in um, sinus rhythm or in atrial fibrillation, we will continue anticoagulation depending on the risk profile of the patient. So that came out of this. So that was a good thing. Um, the other um, things that um, they, they considered, so, you know, just basically to conclude, um, we talked about the rhythm control strategy, um, not having a survival benefit, and anticoagulation that was needed for patients, regardless of um, whether their rhythm was controlled or not, right? Um, this combined with the PABA CHF um, trial, which was um, a prospective randomized multicenter trial. Um, it looked at um, pulmonary vein isolation versus AV node ablation and biventricular pacing. So it was kind of rate control versus rhythm control in patients with heart failure um, and um, patients with heart failure and um, on basically using ablation, right? Um, and what they looked at, they looked at the ejection fraction, they looked at your six minute walk, and they also looked at other factors, um, looking at quality of life of the patient, but not necessarily mortality. What did they find? They found that the primary endpoint was exceeded in the pulmonary vein isolation group. So this was one patient who, um, one patient population where pulmonary vein isolation was considered to be demonstrated to be better then rhythm control was demonstrated to be better than rate control, okay? Um, so more trials have been done with the idea that, you know, we're trying to, as pulmonary vein isolation has become, um, more investment has been put into that, it's become a little bit more successful. Um, there are less um, complications from it. Uh, the complications that folks used to be afraid of were perforation of the heart, um, 
pulmonary vein stenosis, you know, that was a big one, which um, would cause a lot of morbidity in certain patients. Um, so, and then going transeptal, you know, the risk for stroke. So as the procedure itself got safer, um, there were more trials that were done with the idea of figuring out, well, is there a mortality benefit to patients having, um, you know, a pulmonary vein isolation um, or rhythm control um, versus just rate, rate control, and specifically looking at a pulmonary vein isolation. So um, in 2019, um, the Cabana trial was finally um, published, um, looking at patients um, that were treated between November 2009 and October 2017. Um, with either catheter ablation or conventional medical therapy. They looked at, you know, stroke, mortality, bleeding, cardiac arrest, and they randomized patients one-to-one -one, um, with ablation versus drug use um, and drug use for rate control. Um, and the rate control or rhythm control. And um, they looked at also long AFib episodes, excluding patients who had had a prior ablation or who had failed, um, you know, antiarrhythmic medications previously. Um, and so when they looked at patients with um, new onset atrial fibrillation, they found that ablation was not superior to drug therapy um, at five years. Now, the success of ablation in this um, trial was about 50%. So that was pretty low. Um, they also um, did see, though, that there was a significant um, reduction in um, death or CV um, hospitalization. So the composite of the two was decreased with ablation um, than with medication. And um, ablation did demonstrate superior efficacy to drug therapy. So, you know, that's something that moves ablation a little bit higher up, right? And, um, in our consideration. There was another trial that was done looking at an early rhythm control um, strategy to rate control um, in patients with AFib. Um, this was an international study looking at early atrial fibrillation um, in patients who were between um, 65 and uh, 75 years old um, that um, basically um, had atrial fibrillation that was newly diagnosed. And what they wanted to do was um, look at early rhythm control. So that was either with medication or with ablation um, versus your normal management. And because the complication, um, the um, results were so good, um, where you actually had significant improvement in patient clinical status and mortality with early rhythm control than with rate control, they actually stopped due to efficacy at the third interim analysis. So it didn't even actually complete, they didn't actually complete the trial, they stopped early because the results were consistent. Um, in another group of patients um, with heart failure, um, you looked at um, patient, um, catheter ablation versus medical therapy for paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation um, in patients who had an ICD. So therefore you were able to tell whether they were in rate control or um, rhythm control um, or an AFib or not. Um, an ejection fraction of less than 35% and an NYHA class of two to four. Um, what they found was that in looking at a composite of dearth and death and worsening heart failure, patients who got an ablation did better than patients who did not. Um, and so this is another population of patients where a catheter ablation would be better and rhythm control would be better than, um, you know, than medical therapy or rate control um, of AFib. So in considering um, ablation, and you know, I hope um, you'll agree that that's basically where everything is going, right? In considering ablation, um, which strategy um, would you want to use? Let's say you decided that you were going to do use um, a rhythm control and a pulmonary vein isolation um, strategy. Well, there are a couple of um, 
strategies that have been um, proven to be successful. One of them is by burning, right? And the other is by cooling. And so we've done, you know, ablations with the, um, with the cryo balloon where we isolate using that. Is a little bit on the more expensive side, but the procedure ends up being shorter. And at least in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, we found results that are similar to your radio frequency ablation, which is below here, where you have your catheter that produces heat. And with a point by point, you're able to form a scar along the, um, the pulmonary veins. So it does, the second procedure does take a lot of dexterity. Um, it is a little bit more, at least in my experience, I found it to be a little bit longer lasting than um, cryoablation, but you know, there's some people that um, agree with the other point. So, and we usually use, do both of these with the assistance from um, a three-dimensional um, navigational system. There is a new strategy that's coming down the pipe called electroporation. And the idea is that you have this non-thermal ablation technology that is able to isolate tissue, cardiac tissue and treat that and not treat anything else. So you would preserve the nerves. Um, sometimes there's a risk for um, phrenic nerve injury. So you would actually um, preserve that. Um, and then there's also a risk for vascular smooth muscle and esophageal smooth muscle injury. Um, and so with electroporation, the idea is that that's decreased. So the advantage of this is that you have kind of a one-shot ablation technique um, where anyone could go into the left atrium, get rid of the, um, the or isolate the pulmonary veins, um, and you wouldn't need a lot of dexterity or skill. Um, but the disadvantage, of, obviously, is that anyone could do it. And so you might end up having more complications, um, at least at the beginning, because everybody thinks that it's deceptively easy, right, to go into the left atrium. Um, but, and then in addition to that, there is um, newly found a risk for coronary artery spasm, where if you are a little bit too close to the coronaries, um, you can actually cause spasm. Um, and cause injury there. So um, it's still under um, considerable, um, it's still under considerable um, investigation. Um, it's not really um, widespread right now, but we'll see what happens in the next few years. Now during surgery, we can also have surgical relations. Um, sometimes you can do a converge procedure where you actually do a, uh, um, internal or intravascular ablation and combine that with a surgical ablation. So you're getting both the endovascular, um, the endocardial and the epicardial surfaces of the heart to form a full transmural scar. Um, advantage usually is that it's mostly done during other surgeries. Um, but if you're not having another surgery, that means that you are having a thoracotomy, either a full-on thoracotomy or a partial thoracotomy um, done just for an ablation. Um, and then with epicardial ablations, there's sometimes you might have flutter following. And so you're dooming that patient to another procedure. So um, sometimes, you know, those are things to consider. So back to Ms. JS. You know, we um, started off her ablation. We decided that we were going to do a pulmonary vein isolation in this patient because she was very symptomatic. Um, and so what we did was we went into the left atrium of the heart. Um, we're able to see wherever you see the pink, that's basically where she has good electrical signals. Um, and you can tell here that there is some, well, take my word for it, there is some scar. So basically between these areas of pink, you also have some green and some gray and all these colors are supposed to um, basically show you the different, um, the different voltages that you have in the tissue. And you can tell there's a difference in the voltage of the tissue here. Um, and so what we were trying to do is isolate 
both of these veins. So consider that you're looking at the left atrium from the back side, right? And this is the veins over here, up and down here, up and down over there. And this is the um, posterior um, left atrium. The right atrium would be sitting over here and the rest of the heart would be down here. So this is just the left atrium that we were able to um, trace out. And this is what happens at the end. So basically you have your um, left atrium where in the middle there, the posterior wall, you have um, this pink um, tissue. That means that the tissue has a good amount of voltage, but this red tissue is now scar. So basically this entire left, um, left sided veins and right sided veins, they do show you that they're now isolated from the rest of the heart. So yay, our left atrial, um, your pulmonary vein isolation here was complete. <coughs> now, 18 months later, <coughs> she comes into um, the hospital. Oh, okay. So she said that we should go over the colors again. <coughs> oh, sorry. So... I was just saying, um, basically, I don't know how much you're able to see here, but over here, you can tell that um, the differences in color depend on your voltage. And depending on the company, they will have a different um, color scheme. <coughs> so it's not always the same. Um, here, we use Biosense Webster, which is a J&J &J company. And um, basically for them, if your um, voltage is um, less than a certain amount, so here it was less than 0 0.1, then it was considered to be red. And then it follows the um, colors of the rainbow until you get to purple, which is, or pink, which is basically your um, voltage that's greater than 0 0.5. So everything there is in between is kind of like a gradation from that. So for you or for anyone really, what you want to do is whenever you see an electro an atomic map, what you're looking at is looking at the legend here. And usually they'll define whatever we're um, looking at based off of the legend. So over here, this is at the beginning of the ablation. And this was at the end of the ablation. The red was the scar and the pink is the tissue that is alive. And basically what you see at the beginning here is that the pulmonary veins are connected to the rest of the heart. Um, and here, the pulmonary veins are isolated from the rest of the heart. So the voltage that you see here is less than 0 0.1 uh, millivolts. Um, whereas um, here it wasn't, it was basically the same as the rest of the heart. So um, 18 months later, she has, a, you know, comes back in still with um, tachycardia. Um, and you can see on the EKG that this is not quite the same as it was previously, right? You can kind of see, you know, some P waves, right? Here, here, and they march out. So when you see that, then you're a little bit concerned that you actually might have an atrial flutter, which is not uncommon in um, patients who have had a pulmonary vein isolation previously. So whenever you see an atrial flutter, first thing you want to do is to determine if it's a right-sided atrial flutter or a left-sided atrial flutter. If it's right-sided atrial flutter, which is a CTI-dependent flutter or a more typical flutter, then you would ablate on the right side. This was a left-sided flutter. And the reason why I know that is just based off of um, what it looks like, where you can see um, what the um, activation looks like when you compare V1 to 2, 3, and AVF. Um, and so what we um, looked at was try to figure out, OK, let's go back into this patient to see exactly what's going on. So this was her map again. Um, again, we're looking at the posterior um, wall of the left atrium. These are the pulmonary veins that are sticking up here and that's the posterior wall. <laughs> 
Um, you do see, okay, well, most of the post pulmonary veins are isolated, but you see some reconnection in some areas, right? Um, but the other thing that we see is that posterior wall is no longer nice and pink, right? <clears throat> it actually has a little bit of scar there too now, right? And then now we mapped according to the timing. So this is looking at, you know, um, the cycle length of the flutter. And what we were able to find was that there was an area where the late part of the cycle was in close contact with the early part of the cycle. And basically what that means is that this is a atrial flutter that is in the left side. <clears throat> So this is, we've turned things around a little bit. As you can see, this is Shlomo's face here. So this tells us that this is the anterior portion of the heart, pulmonary veins are back here. Um, and then on that septal um, anterior portion, what we find here is that there is this area of slow conduction that um, makes it, and you can see based off of the EGMs that are there, this seems like a place that is actually causing our, um, our flutter um, to happen. So what we did was we kind of re-isolated the, um, re the pulmonary veins and were able to complete that. And then the second thing that we did was try to um, affect the, um, the flutter. Um, initially, usually when we mapped it out, it looked like it was a mitral isthmus flutter. So what we did was um, go a little bit across to do a mitral isthmus line. This was more of a anterior mitral isthmus line. Um, and then we also got rid of some scar as well. So initially we went for the area of slow conduction that didn't necessarily um, terminate the ablation. And so this was um, the final line what, that we did from the um, left um, upper pulmonary vein all the way across in front of the um, left atrial appendage down to the um, mitral, um, mitral valve. And that actually terminated um, our flutter. Now, um, the question was, um, could the flutter have been suppressed by the atrial fib or do we think that this is new onset? Um, I think that it's new onset, and that's based off of the activation of the um, left atrium that we saw. So 18 months prior, even though I didn't really show you what we were able to map on the anterior wall of the left atrium, everything was pink, everything was nice and alive, and you know, um, there wasn't any area of scar. And so most of the time, whenever you see um, whenever you see um, a flutter, typically you will see scar. And in this particular situation, we didn't see scar previously, but we did see scar later. So it does tell us that in this particular patient, um, the etiology of the atrial fibrillation is most likely something else. So it's not just enough that we have, you know, gotten rid of the AFib. We also have to change the risk factors that are contributing to the formation of scar in their left atrium. So going back to um, an initial slide that I showed you guys earlier, where we looked at what can cause atrial fibrillation, um, we talked about, you know, the genetics, obesity, aging, hypertension. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we look at obstructive sleep apnea that can cause it. Um, and so when you see all of that, then you want to um, get rid of that or at least control those risk factors as much as possible. So back to our lady, um, once we um, ablated, we got um, rid of the atrial flutter, it terminated during ablation, which is a very satisfying feeling. And once we were done, this is our EKG and she is still a couple of years later doing well in sinus rhythm. Um, so we'll see how everything goes. All right, so uh, this is my bibliography and thank you. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'll stop sharing now. Let's see. Yeah, Dr. Jamal, thank you very much, ma'am. Oh, no problem. Yeah.
thank you for uh, that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the group? I know I actually have a couple, but I'll let some other people jump in before I run my mouth too much here. I've got a question, but I'll let you go. Do you want me to go first? Yes. Okay. Bef before the question, sorry, uh, Dr. Jama, where you know a number of our fellows that are going for exams mm -hmm. in the next few months are in this, they log in for this lecture. Mm -hmm. So, and um, atrial fibrillation is one of the biggest thing that almost every time you encounter it in exam in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, I I want you to take some time to explain all those Chasva score, how do you use them? When are they indicated? Because these are the basic things that they will be asked in the exams, either in MCQ, ORA, or in one phase of the cardiology exam or the other. Then okay. also the no, yeah, the no pharmacological uh, treatment of atria. You have dwell with, you have talked about a number of them. So all these areas so that if they catch them, the memory will be so fresh to deliver it to their examiners. Thank you, okay. So let me answer some other questions and then I can, um, I'll, I'll go through that one really quickly. So um, any other questions? Um, so one question from the group, uh, do you place on some drugs after ablation or, and for how long? So post ablation, their uh, medical therapy specific to the ablation. So not necessarily specific to the ablation. I think um, it, it really depends on the, I, I think it depends on the, um, on the, on the patient, right? So for some patients who I know that, okay, this was a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation um, ablation, then I will do a beta blocker. I don't like to do um, antiarrhythmics first off, um, just so that I can see how successful it is or not and you know treat accordingly. Um, there are some folks who I go in and I see, oh, this patient has a really bad, like scarred heart, and then I will put them on an antiarrhythmic. Um, remember that there are certain patients, there are certain medications that you can't put on certain patients. So for instance, your um, group 1A antiarrhythmics, your fleconide, propafenone, you can't do that in patients with, um, with structural heart disease. Um, your um, sotolol, is not great in somebody who has like increased liver disease. So, you know, those are things that you need to look at. Um, amiodarone is a great drug for everybody, except for the patients who end up having thyroid issues or lung issues. Um, but if I have somebody, let's say with heart failure, and I know that, okay, I really want this patient to stay out of AFib. And plus in the first month after we do the ablation, the heart is irritated. I've just burned a lot inside of it. It can get really irritated, can have a lot of PACs, can put the patient more into atrial fibrillation. Those patients I'll put on um, amiodarone. Um, and then other patients, um, depending on how, um, what I see during the study, um, if the ejection fraction is normal, I'll put them on flecainide. Um, and if not, I just put them on a beta blocker. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions from the group, and it looks like it was partially answered as, uh, when do you choose ablation over medical therapy? Um, and then as someone had chimed in that there's not a lot of evidence of the pro prognostic benefits of stroke um, as far as prevention with AF versus uh, symptomatic benefits. And actually that was one of the things that I had to ask too, is, you know, the affirm trial is showing antiarrhythmics regardless because the stroke benefit. Do we have a link between AFib and stroke prevention, or is it more heart failure? And oh, so that's more in the um, what is it called in the in the trials for um, anticoagulation. So remember, a firm did show that there was um, a relationship between stroke and AFib. Right. Mm. And so when you um, consider, um, so once they took that, that was the hypothesis generating part of it. And then they went and did the, um, the trials to, um, to more kind of formalize um, your CHAD score and then your CHAD VASC score. Mm. And so um, in looking at, so even though 
there isn't a specific trial that looks at it. If you look at the CHADS, um, the CHADS 2 numbers and the CHADS VASC numbers, um, they have looked at patients who are on anticoagulation and um, their risk factors um, for um, stroke. And based on the CHADS-VAS score, they have shown a difference between um, AFib, um, sorry, it, between stroke incidence in patients who are on, atrial, uh, on anticoagulation and those not on anticoagulation, um, just based off of um, based off of um, their um, their risk factors. Was I clear? I might not. Yeah. So it's that last point, you're basically saying that the medication and the stroke score are are correlated, but do we have a, a like staying in and out of AFib and, and stroke outcome. There's, is there a direct link or is so it more? There have been other studies that have been done um, where they're looking at, and actually that's what I'm kind of looking at. I, I do have a, um, a um, presentation that um, looked at, um, <laughs> that looked at um, stroke and mm. AFib. And, um, but these were done because it's difficult to figure out, okay, how much AFib you have, right? So previously yeah. what used to happen was, you know, the way that we were testing for atrial fibrillation was by putting a patient on a Holter monitor, for instance, you know, which is like 24 hours, right? Or putting a patient <laughs> on a vet monitor, which is for 30 days. And that in and of itself was not, um, that in and of itself was not, um, you know, enough, right? Because a lot of patients, well, first of all, the event monitors, they didn't actually give you um, a full picture of what the patient was doing during that period of time. It would only give you certain events, right? But now we have other things, right? We have MCOT, which is the mobile cardiac telemetry, right? Mm -hmm. Which can actually look at what rhythm you're in the entire time you're wearing it, but it depends on you wearing it all the time, right? So that's one. And then of course, there's the implantable loop recorders, which changed the game, right? So there have been studies that looked at patients with pacemakers, right? Where they said, oh, okay, based on the pacemakers, um, we know that this person is in atrial fibrillation for this period of time. So what is their risk for stroke? Hmm. Um, and what they have found is that, um, you know, for patients who have AFib that lasts longer than 24 hours, it does increase your risk for stroke um, if you have episodes that are longer than 24 hours okay. versus if you have paroxysmal episodes that are less than six hours. Mm -hmm. So that's as much as we know. So people have extrapolated from that to say, well, the more AFib you have, the mm -hmm. worse, the more likely you are to have a stroke does that, is that really, um, I, I don't think anybody's gonna go back and litigate, you know, go back and do another, another, you know, study on, okay, exactly how much AFib does it take and all that kind of stuff, especially since we have also realized that the risk for stroke itself has actually been going down. So the numbers that we were using previously, right, in our CHADS VASC numbers and in our CHADS 2 numbers, people have tried to recreate that when, they, when they've been testing for new medications like our um, NOAX, right? So when they were trying to do for, um, for the Watchman procedure, when they were trying to look at patients for, um, for, um, for treatment using um, Cervesa or Eliquis or Viroxaban. And the difficulty they were having was that the risk for stroke was actually lower than it had historically been hmm. just by itself. And so basically by us improving treatment of high blood pressure, heart failure, sleep apnea, we've actually improved the risk for stroke. So it's even becoming harder to show a difference between the two. So I think that's part of the reason, because if you were going to do another trial, you'd need such huge numbers for you to be able to show a difference between two groups. Even though we know that those differences are there, they're not as stark as they were previously because the risk for stroke has actually gone down.
Interesting. I, I don't want to continue to change the subject here, but I would wonder how that would reflect in like low and middle income countries that don't have solutions like we necessarily have in the U.S. for sleep apnea, for things like that. And, um, and if we'll see the question. dichotomy of, yeah, interesting. No, 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 I totally agree. That's that's definitely the question for sure. Um, see, so we had another AJ. question. Yes, sir. AJ. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Uma Adamu. Yep. He wants to speak. Uma Sorry. Adamu. Oh, I see the hand raised. Let me shut up. <laughs> Dr. Adamu. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for, for the presentation and opportunity to speak here. Um, I just want to, to acknowledge her for the presentation. And uh, I think my question might be a bit off what we're presenting, but but very important for what Dr. Duffield said earlier on. Mm -hmm. We we practice here in Nigeria, and we have present presenters, most of whom from the US and from those from the European side. I mm -hmm. wonder what 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 guidelines you want us to use. You want us to use the EAC guideline or to use the AHA ACC guideline because if people if candidates are going for exams and they ask, they ask them, which one would they have to cut from? Because these guidelines are released every, every five years. So my question is, which guidelines you want us to adopt in Nigeria before we start developing our own? Is it AHA or ESC? Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, what's helpful is that they're kind of off cycle, right? So the ESC is usually five years after AHA. So it's helpful because what that means is you use the most recent one that's come out. Okay, uh, so thank you, Dr. AHA, AHA comes yes. every 10 years. ESC comes every 10 years, so they're kind of five years. Do you want us to adopt the ESC or the AHA AC? That's my question because- I know, it's and I said the most recent that's, one that's that has come question. out. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Jamal, uh, thank you. Let me, let me just add something there. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Guy is here. He's an examiner in the college. Maybe okay. he may also speak. Uh, but if such a question come up, a candidate meet any examiner and a question on this issue come up, what I usually advise is that quote the particular guideline that you are using for the examiner. If you say you are using ESC, quote the ESC so that the examiner knows that you are speaking from the ESC guideline. If you are using the American guideline, also quote that according to the AHA and ACC uh, 2000, so, so this is what is stated here. So that the, the examiners are well familiarized with these two guidelines. So um, the other thing, that is a way to dodge any oral questions in the exam. Maybe um, uh, Professor Ga may add one or two things because it's a very long standing examiner uh, with the college. Then um, uh, uh, what, what we use here in um, uh, Dr. Damu, you know the answer. So you should tell us some issue because we have a lot of fellows because this program was actually advertised in many platforms. And many of our fellows are going for exams or joining to get the current update on this issue. And that is also part of why we put it so that because they are going for exam in few weeks from now so that they will be able to get the current uh, breeze of what is happening in AF. So Dr. Adama, I'm sure you are very current in all these issues. So you can contribute one or two things to the questions you, you ask. Sir. But in the case of MCQ, I think what the, uh, what the, what the, the, the questions are straightforward in MCQ. If it is oral, they may require you to talk about which guideline that you are using. So be familiar with one guideline. If you are familiar with the uh, with the American, okay. If you are familiar with the European, okay. There is no problem. But the differences between the two guidelines are not that much. Most times they are very similar. So I think that is what I would say. Maybe Professor Gam may also contribute to it. I had a couple more questions in the chat. Well, okay. before we start off with um, 
before we start off with the question is I just kind of wanted to run through some of the, going back to Dr. Edetha's original question, which was, you know, kind of going through how to manage atrial fibrillation. Um, so basically um, I wanted to touch on a few things. Um, first thing, kind of knowing what the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation was. So we already talked about the timing of, you know, AFib, whether you have paroxysmal persistent and then permanent, which is more of a decision, right? But most of the time you won't have a permanent AFib without having it being so persistent that it's just kind of difficult to control. Um, and so for those two things, you need um, a trigger and a substrate. What we're trying to do with treatment of AFib is to get rid of the trigger and also change your substrate a little bit. Um, we talked about the patterns, um, a few things about testing. Um, first of all, we, there, is, there are recommendations that you want to test patients who, um, or screen patients who are greater than 65 years of age with an EKG. Um, that's a class one indication. Um, in a patient who's had a stroke, you want them to be on EKG monitoring continuously for at least 24 hours. And it's reasonable for you to actually implant a loop recorder um, to determine if they have atrial fibrillation as a result. Um, um, that's causing the AFib. And then um, the other thing that you want to do um, is um, you can do um, EKG screening for um, all patients who um, have, um, you know, symptom, symptoms as a result. Now, um, we talked a little bit about the CHAD score. And the reason why we, the CHAS score is important is because, um, or the CHAS VAS score is important, is because it will determine who gets treated for atrial, um, for stroke prevention um, versus not. Um, for the patients who, um, the CHAS VAS score basically stands for these terms. So the C is for congestive heart failure, hypertension. We have two H categories. One of them is an age greater than 75. The other is an age 65 to 74. Diabetes, your risk for stroke, vascular disease, and then also the sex factor. So basically um, your female sex as um, a risk factor or not. And basically what we found was that based off of your chas vas score, um, it increases your risk, risk for stroke in a specific um, rate per year. And this is all published in the EHJ um, journal in 2010. So now I've mentioned that these numbers are much lower than they were previously. So these numbers, if they did another chas vas score again, the numbers would change again based off of, you know, because the rate per year of stroke has changed since 2010. Um, but this is what they based it off of. So if you had eight of these factors, you know, it was 6.7, seven, it was 9.6. I don't know how it went down, but then it came back up and then nine was 15.2. But um, in any case, um, in any case, once you have a chas vas score that's greater than or equal to two, um, that's actually um, considered to be significant enough that the patient should either be on warfarin or um, a, like a NOAC such as um, Eliquis or sorry, Apixaban or Rivaroxaban um, or Adoxaban, right? If the um, chas vas score is zero, then their rate is pretty negligible. And if their chas vas score is one, it's just a little bit above um, the rate per year of um, anybody else who doesn't have any of these risk factors. So they recommend a discussion with the patient to determine if they wanna be on the stronger um, medications or not. Um, and then with regards to, um, so basically for um, stroke prevention, if the patient doesn't have valvular disease, so if they don't have a mechanical valve or moderate or severe mitral stenosis, then um, you can go according to the chas vas score, where if there's zero, then you don't need to do anticoagulation. If it's greater than or equal to two, then you want a NOAC, a VKA, which is your warfarin, or um, a left atrial appendage occlusion device. Um, and then if it's one, then uh, oral anticoagulation should be considered, but um, that's a discussion um, with the patient. 
And then um, somebody was asking, Dr. Kunigal was asking, is the Chaz Vascor one or anti for anticoagulation or two? So it's two for a definite, and then one should be discussed with the patient. And um, in the newest um, update, there was a question about whether um, you should consider the female sex factor, is that actually significant or not? And there's some folks who have argued that it is reasonable for you to actually subtract that. So therefore, if it's greater than two, as long as one of the two is not the patient being female, then you should. So it's three for women, two for men, and it makes it a little bit confusing. I don't go by that because that doesn't make any sense, but that's what's in the guidelines at this present time. Um, other thing to look at is um, the HasBled score, which is basically a score that um, is to consider the risk for bleeding for each patient. So what they look at is um, hypertension, abnormal renal or liver function, stroke, bleeding history or disposition, labile INR, if the patient is elderly and if the patient uses drugs or alcohol concomitantly, um, and that does increase your risk with a risk um, with a number greater than two being significant enough. Um, and that's what we use to determine if the patient will need um, um, will need um, either or should be considered for a left atrial appendage occlusion device. And um, does that answer your questions, Dr. Adafa? Correct. Thank you very much. Yes, it is. Okay. And then, um, all right, so, okay, did you want to read the questions, AJ? Yeah, yeah. so we had another question about uh, indications for pacemaker when implanting, sorry, uh, when implanting a patient with AFib. So single versus dual chamber considerations. Um, in the absence of ability of ablation, what determines choice of rhythm control over rate control? And then finally, a word on management of AFib with hemodynamic imbalance. So it's kind of a lot, but let's, I guess, start with the dual versus single chamber in an AFib patient. How much is enough to give them a single chamber? So I would say for you to give them a single chamber, you have to basically say that this patient is going to be in permanent AFib. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is not in permanent atrial fibrillation, then I don't think that you should be putting a single chamber. The patient should get a dual chamber. Because if you don't, then um, you risk a situation where the patient goes into sinus rhythm and then they end up having, um, you know, pacemaker syndrome as a result. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be, end up becoming more of a headache later on down the line. So if it's permanent AFib, if they look like they have a crazy big, let's say it's a new atrial fibrillation, but they have a crazy big left atrium and this is never going to convert, then yes, it's reasonable for you to say, okay, this is permanent atrial fibrillation, just putting in a single chamber. And we do that all the time, um, mm -hmm. but it usually has to be a really big left atrium. The patient has mitral stenosis or mitral valve disease, and you have no consideration that this patient will actually go back into sinus rhythm. Okay. I think considerations too is access to devices, complexity of procedure, and you know ability to extract um, or occlusion later in life. So I think that's things you all have to take into account depending on where you live and what kind of system you, you're in. Uh -huh. um, I know that uh, in the past I've spoken, and Julius, you can chime in, but there's some places that only do single chamber devices due to complexity. Um, but complexity. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Julius, do, do you have more insight on this? Because I, I don't have that kind of yeah. information. I know you just mentioned to me in the past. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, AJ. Yeah, in, in, in um, Accra, in Ghana, um, and also in Kumase, the second bigger city, yeah, they used to do single chambers all the time. So just because they, they didn't know how to do dual chamber implants um, so up until recently. Um, so yeah, pace, pacemaker syndrome used to happen all the time. Yeah. yeah, it's a real shame. Yeah. So they need they need training. Pace for life. That's what pace for life is there for. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Dr. John, I have uh, another question. Mm -hmm. um, for patients that have AF, what guide you the choice of um, 
intracardial loop recorder among them. Then two, if you want to do a cardioversion in AF, what, uh, what guides your judgment for this uh, long-standing AF that have been there, the atrium is large, and you want to really see how you can convert the patient. Because I remember the last meeting, uh, the last uh, uh, mission that was in um, September last year, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Badibo, me, uh, I, Dr. Badibo and I, we cardioverted uh, one of the patients that we needed to put um, an ICD for. So mm -hmm. we did that, um, but we tried almost three times. It wasn't successful. Uh, we now say, okay, let's go ahead and uh, just deploy a dual, uh, dual chamber ICD, which, mm -hmm. what, which was what we did. And mm -hmm. then we now say, okay, let's put the patient on uh, medication to see whether he can uh, chemically cardiovert. So mm -hmm. that was actually what we did for the patient. And um, even though we put that patient, I think, on a dual chamber ICD, um, what we did, I, I'm not very, uh, the patient just needed for, um, for tachytherapy, not for pacing uh, purposes. So mm -hmm. I really want to get your view on these issues. So um, for me, because, and I, 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 full disclosure, because I'm EP and I love sinus rhythm, I cardiovert everyone. Now, cardiovert everyone. <laughs> I, I cardiovert everybody, at least once, because I tell people oh. everybody deserves cardioversion. A few <laughs> reasons why. The first reason is because um, when you're asking, you know, one of the reasons to cardiovert someone is to see if they're symptomatic. A lot of patients, when you ask them, hey, you're in atrial fibrillation, do you feel your symptoms? A lot of them will say, no, I'm not symptomatic, I feel great. And then you cardiovert them and they say, oh my God, I didn't realize I was so tired and now I have so much energy. So then that gives you the impetus to be a little bit more aggressive, right? If the patient really feels the difference between sinus rhythm and not. So that's one reason. And the second thing is, yes, I can tell you that, okay, if somebody has a big atrium that's severely enlarged, most likely will not stay in sinus rhythm. But I have seen cases where a patient has a huge atrium, we cardiovert the patient, put the patient on amiodarone for a few months, and then the atrium gets smaller and the patient actually does great. So, and then the EF gets better, they feel better. I take them off of amio and they're doing good. And so, and, and because I, I also work in a, um, a safety net hospital which doesn't have ablation um, capabilities at this point, right? So I am very comfortable in the medical management of AFib, right? Um, and so in, in those situations, the amount of patients that I've seen who get better with just cardioversion, putting them on medicines and watching for a little while um, really makes me think, okay, there is, there is a reason to do so. So I am a little bit more on the more aggressive side for sure, but I cardiovert everyone at least once. There's some people as I'm cardioverting, I'm like, this person will never stay in sinus rhythm. I know this, like, you know, the atrium is bigger than the ventricle. I don't know why I'm trying, but you know, we got, we, we got to try for yes, the sake of all righteousness. And I do it, the patient doesn't. And I'm like, eh. And then there's certain things also, like if the patient clearly has a restrictive, there's sometimes the patient has clearly a restrictive, like looks like it's restrictive or constrictive you know, that's never going to, they're going to go back into sinus rhythm before you leave the room. I'm going back into AFib before you leave the room. So, you know, there are certain cases where you are very sure that this is actually secondary to something else. It's a secondary AFib, in which case, if you don't fix the, whatever is the preempting issue, then that's not going to help. So um, the things to guide you in cardioversion are your left atrial size, um, just your, your medications that you can use. I use amiodarone a lot um, with the understanding that, you know, hey, amiodarone is not the, for 10% of patients, 
it will cause hypothyroid and it could cause with longer use could cause, you know, lung disease and all of that. So it has to be with a patient that you know is going to follow up, that you know you're going to, um, you know, look at their numbers and check their labs. Um, so there are patients that I would put on amiodarone for a little while, for at least six months, while we try to figure things out. And if after six months, they're still in AFib, then I let it go. Then I say, okay, now we're just going to go with rate control and you're a permanent AFib patient. Um, yeah. You spoke and then, on so for your for your choice of device. Mm -hmm. um, my I think the only time that it becomes a, a if if the if the device if I'm putting in an ICD for primary prevention in those patients I'll just put a single chamber because I mean mm -hmm. there's really yeah. no reason for you to put a dual chamber right if the patient doesn't have evidence of sick sinus syndrome or something now if they're paroxysmal they're going into in and out and whenever they're um, and sinus rhythm, they're slow, but whatever they are AFib, they're fast, then yes, you should put a dual chamber because they're going to go in and out, right? But if it's just for primary prevention, they haven't demonstrated that they get bradycardic, then I'll put a single chamber in. Um, yeah. If, but for the bi-V patient, I think that that's the patient that it becomes a little bit more complicated, right? Because for the yeah. bi-V patient, if they're in AFib for a lot of the time, then you could have a situation where they're not pacing a lot and they don't get that advantage of biventricular pacing. Um, so that becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, and in those patients, it's typically easier, if you can, to take out the node. So you can either do that, you know, surgically or, you know, with procedures, or you can do that medically, right? So if you beta block a patient, if their blood mm -hmm. pressure lets you, if you beta block them down enough, then you can let the um, BIV do its thing. And usually for BIVs, I will put in an atrial lead because there, I mean, I don't, there isn't any BIV device that doesn't have an atrial port. So I just put in the atrial lead. Because that okay. <laughs> good, good, good answer, Ma. That is good. That is good. Uh, but my, um, it's maybe also I better speak, for I will, speak, I will speak with you um, uh, maybe after this meeting. Uh, okay. Because some of my some of my patients that um, had um, long-standing atrial fibrillation, I just uh, do um, a bi-v pacing for them without uh, doing a CRT without them um, without the uh, the right atrial uh, lead. Uh, I found out that a number of them are still doing very well, mm -hmm. and the yeah. So then, secondly. Um, uh, there are many centers in Europe currently, they, they see follow the same procedure. A very good example is uh, Northampton. Uh, once a patient is on a chronic, a very long standing atrial fibrillation, once the device is coming in, we just cap the, uh, the right atrial lead down. Um, and uh, their patient seems to also be doing well. So I will speak with you on this matter uh, when maybe when when I give a call to you, we'll talk privately. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. There are a couple of reasons. Like I understand that. And you know, like I said, those are they're not any wrong reasons. I think there have been too many times for me personally that I have seen where I'm like, ugh, I wish I knew if this were like it's confusing enough that I wish I had an atrial lead to determine whether this mm -hmm. was one yeah. rhythm versus the other that I'm yes. like I don't want to if I if I if I'm going to put in a bivy I'm going to put in an atrial lead because I don't want this to ever be a question in my mind so yes yeah. I, I understand I understand the reason for capping for sure and especially if I have a patient where I didn't cap the lead this person was an AFib I knew they were an AFib and then they have to come back because I have to revise the atrial lead then I'll say look you see <laughs> I should have kept that lead. So there, there are definitely <laughs> reasons yeah. why to and why not to, but you know, mm. I don't think that there's any wrong answer in that. Is you're only yes, as you're you're the physician, the physician you are is based off of the patient that you saw last week. Thank I you, man. Addition, I think the addition of an A lead also gives you uh, helps with your discriminators, especially in a mm. CRTD. So it mm. allows you to allows you to go down that rate branch of if is A greater than B is, as where if you mm. don't have that A lead and it is capped, then you really are relying just on either rate control, rate management, or uh, perhaps wavelet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think the presence of an A lead and a CRTD, I think is, is quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. I agree. 
<laughs> okay. We had, an, we had another question. Um, so uh, commencing anticoagulants in a new onset ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, uh, patient with atrial fibrillation. So if it doesn't seem to be going away, when do you commence anticoagulants and I guess for how long? I mean, honestly, for that, I really depend on the stroke neurologist for guidance. Um, if the patient has a stroke with hemorrhagic conversion um, or any sort of hemorrhage, they usually wait 30 days. Um, and sometimes they're okay. I've been surprised. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, you can go ahead and do it. But I really depend on the, um, on the, on the stroke neurologist. So the neurologist usually typically answers that question for me. Okay. Uh, patient on amiodarone after six months and they've uh, been in sinus rhythm, do we take them off or leave them on amio? I usually will take them off. Okay. Depending on, so there, there are a few things <laughs> that I will do. I will, after six months, they're in sinus rhythm. I look at their echocardiogram. Echocardiogram looks great. EF is not low. You know, they're looking great and they don't have any hypothyroid, lungs look good, I usually will take them off. And the reason why is because the risks that you see with amiodarone use are typically with long use of amiodarone. So after the one year, two year mark, then yeah. you start seeing all of these things come up and people will say, well, why? I've been on this medicine for five years. Why is my thyroid now getting bigger than my jaw? And it's like, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> it's typically that way. So um, I usually just try to leave well enough alone, just take them off of it and see what happens. So what you should note though, that is that amiodarone will stay in the body for about a month. The half-life mm -hmm. is really long. So some people after a month, they'll be like, yeah, nothing's happening. We're great. Like, nope, it's the second month that you have to watch out for because that's when you start seeing the effects. And, you know, typically I will bring them back a month later. I'll bring them back two months after that, you know, and I will control their other risk factors as much as possible. So their, you know, blood pressure will be very well controlled. If they're in heart failure, make sure that they're euvolemic, you know, keeping everything just so. If they have sleep apnea, they're on a CPAP machine, you know, all of these things. And then, you know, exercise, weight loss, all of that, that definitely does help with um, AFib, um, you know, control. Um, and so those are definitely reasonable things to do as well. But yes, after six months, I will take them off. Take them off. Um, doctor, looks like Dr. Oga had a question as well. No, he said that his network is unstable uh -huh. and uh, he can't, uh, it's unstable, so he can't comment now. So he said, can I comment now? So yeah. you can call on him, call on okay, him. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Sorry for, uh, thank you, Joma, for, for the excellent uh, presentation. I think um, I was asked to comment on- um, Yes, the exam. Of, uh, guidelines and all. I think generally um, in now own clinic and in most clinics, uh, you know, Europe is closer to us. Most of us attend European mini, uh, meetings uh, more often than the American meetings and uh, our National Cardiac Society is also an affiliate member uh, of the ESC. So, and preferentially, um, the, personally, I see the ESC write-ups as more straightforward. I'm sorry to say that than the American uh, <laughs> guidelines. So we use it. Totally agree with you. <laughs> so, so we usually use the ESC guidelines, uh, and um, most of the things you have spoken about the, the exams will revolve around this. Although most of the interventions we don't, we don't do here, but basic uh, bedside diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation um, and drug management, as well as uh, landmark trials, uh, we expect this from uh, the residents during the exams. I think uh, 
I don't know whether I've answered made the comment I'm required to make. Dr. Edafe? Yes, yes, boss. You have, you have, sir. I mean, I think honestly that if you look at the last, first of all, the last ACC guidelines for AFib, I think it was like in 2014 or something. Like it's compared to the, I think, and I think the ESC one was like 2019 or so, 2018. And so when you just compare the timing of the two, you know, in the next year or so, the ACC is going to come out with another one, in which case, you know, unless, and there wouldn't have been significant changes, I don't think of since the last ESC. So I think that if you just take the ESC, then they're never really in, they, they're, they never really speak, they're not really in disagreement with each other. They're mostly as a result of new, um, new innovations new additions to the, yeah, new innovations yeah. and new additions to the literature. And so because of the difference in time, I, that's why I said, you know what, just look at the last one that was done. And that's usually what everybody will be doing. Because once the ESC guidelines come about, particularly since it was five years away from the um, AHA guidelines, even in the US, they will, and then they most of the time will actually bring up an update in the AHA guidelines and that will somewhat reflect whatever the ESC guidelines are. Um, I think that there are only a few differences in ESC and AHA guidelines, one of which is like, for instance, placement of pacemaker and looking at an EP, like EP study, the HV interval, it's different in ESC and AHA. ESC says 70, AHA still says 100. Um, but that's really the only difference that I've seen. Everything else is pretty much the same. All right, ma'am. We have a very specific question. Um, I don't know if you want to just take a look at this one, um, uh -huh. but uh, 44, 44 year old female, asymptomatic AFib, incidental finding, ECG a year ago was sinus rhythm. Uh, secondary cause was subclinical hypothyroidism and good LVF. Mildly enlarged LA, declines electrocardioversion, can still use amiodarone during. All right. So I guess, like, should we continue to use amiodarone or do we try to treat and treat the hyperthyroidism or? Yes. I'll let you take that. So if it were, huh, if it were me, anybody who has thyroid issues, I would cardiovert and not do MEO because it can end up being one of those things that can be a little bit brittle. You never know what kind of hypo or hyperthyroidism you can end up getting as a result. And so we already know that amiodarone is not great for patients with hypothyroid and it's not great for patients and it's even worse for patients with hyperthyroid so you know actually if somebody is hyperthyroid you really shouldn't be putting them on amiodarone at all um, and then hypothyroid is kind of a there are some people who will treat um, on it but i typically will take them off if i know that there's a relationship with amio at all so and you, you know sometimes when you talk to patients you know, the, the idea of an electric shock is really jarring to them, you know, because I, I tell them, and I, I usually will tell them when I'm consenting them, I'll tell them very quickly. And they'll say, what, what, what did you say? <laughs> like you said, you will do what? I was like, no, 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 it's just a little electric shock. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's fine, it's great. Um, and I will stress the fact that, you know what, you'll be asleep the entire time. We either use anesthesia or um, I have, usually privileges for deep sedation. So I usually will use Atomidate for those patients. Um, but I think that that goes a long way in kind of easing their mind because if they think that they're going to be awake and you're shocking them, then of course they're more scared about that. Um, so if I talk to them about it, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where if you're very casual about it, they're very, ca they kind of feel that they have to be casual about it as well. Uh, <laughs> and, um, we go from there. So I, I try to cardiovert patients in that situation as much as possible. Now, you know, if they have pre-existing hypo or hypothyroid, you know, typically um, until you've treated what the primary cause is, it actually will not, you can cardiovert them all you want. They will come right back into AFib. So you want to treat what the underlying cause is first. 
and then you can do your cardioversion. And basically what will end up happening is you won't even have to do much else to keep them in sinus rhythm. Perfect, thank you for that. One quick thing, just because I know we have fellows on here and people who are maybe not experienced as much with cardioversions. Um, I'm sure it's in the literature, but as far as coagulation, TEEs or echoes before a cardioversion, what's your process for that? So basically in a patient who has atrial fibrillation, if you know exactly when they went into AFib. So the patient said at two o'clock this morning, I woke up feeling this boom, boom, boom in my chest. I've never felt it before. It happened two hours ago, then you can cardiovert them either chemically or electrically. And remember for the um, for the risk for stroke, chemical cardioversion is the same thing as electrical cardioversion. There's some folks who will think to themselves, oh, if I just give them amio, it's not, the, it's not the same risk for stroke as if I do an electric shock. It's actually the, exactly the same. It's actually the process of them converting. And when you see a heart convert, you will understand the reason why. Because, you know, the, the patient is in AFib and the atrium cream is just doing this thing, but immediately it converts, it goes like boom and it squeezes. So whether it's chemical or electrical, the same mechanical action happens. And so that same clot can go to the brain no matter what you do. So whether it's to give them amiodarone or to do a DC cardioversion, if the patient says, I know exactly when this happened, it started this, or if they were on telemetry and you know exactly when it happened, as long as the timing is less than 48 hours, then you can do a cardioversion without necessarily doing a transesophageal echo or um, um, putting the patient on anticoagulation pre, right? For a patient who you don't know when the AFib started or atrial flutter, you don't know exactly when it started, um, or they have been in atrial fib or atrial flutter for greater than 48 hours, then the, you should either do a transesophageal echo which is basically for you to be able to look at the left atrial appendage and you're able to see whether there is a clot there or not. Or you should um, anticoagulate them for three weeks prior to doing a cardioversion if you don't want to do imaging. And then for everyone who you cardiovert, you have to anticoagulate for at least four weeks, irrespective of Chad's FAST score. So for patients who with a chas score of greater than one, where anticoagulation is a question or is the thing to do, of course, you will cardiovert, um, you'll keep them anticoagulated for the rest of their lives. If they have a chas score of zero and you cardiovert them, you have to keep them on anticoagulation for at least um, for, for at least, um, what is it called? For at least four weeks. And that that's for new onset AFib as well. If it Say it happened yes. five, okay, okay, four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question, you said TE, uh, I'm not sure how available that is in every single um, hospital. Would you, can you do a standard echo? Is that feasible or no? no. So okay. a TEE is specific because mm -hmm. with a transesophageal echo, you can look at the left atrial appendage and you mm -hmm. can look at the left atrial appendage in different angles. So you can see, and anybody who's ever done a transesophageal echo specifically to look at the left atrial appendage, you will see that sometimes the left atrial appendage, it can be a very complex, stru complex structure. So it can have many different fronds that you're not able to see in just one angle. And so you looking at those three to four different angles panning through the left atrial appendage can really tell you, hey, the, there's a clot there or not. The other thing that you can do, which you know, folks are differ as to how specific it is, but there's some folks who will swear on doing a CT scan, like a coronary CT, and it being good enough for you to rule out a uh, um, left atrial appendage thrombus or clot. Perfect, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Any other questions from the group? AJ, Dr. Chigose Chukwasha, his hand is raised up. Oh, there it is, yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. IJ, for the wonderful presentation. I wanted to add, based on my own experience with regards to the question on uh, which guideline to use for those preparing for uh, the part two exams. Mm -hmm. during, our, uh, yes, during our exams, I discovered that the updates uh, lectures, you know, the determined you know, the pattern of questions, especially for 
national exam. Uh, for example, the equations we had are based on hypertensive emergencies. They were drawn from ACC and they were particular. Like if you don't read that ACC guideline, you may not be able to answer it exactly the way the examiner wanted. So there's no harm in looking at both guidelines and they're looking at the update uh, course you know, relevant to the particular topic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any uh, any other questions on the subject matter? We we do have that quiz to cover here at the very end, but I want to make sure we, you know, um, answer any questions anyone might have. I know Julius had just, something on. Fine. Julius, oh, you Jared. Go, no, Jared. No, you go, Julius. I'm oh, sorry, Jared. You, you go on, Jared, if you want. <laughs> no, you've been hanging on a long time, mate. You go. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Akuro. Um, I was going to ask um, maybe a question on the ECG that you showed for for the AF that was um, the pulmonary vein isolation that, um, that you know, had, um, that turned into atrial flutter um, mm -hmm. after 18 months um, on the ECG and it was um, atypical flutter, like a left-sided flutter. Mm -hmm. So you were showing that um, in V1 and also maybe the inferior leads that mm -hmm. were like uh, positive or negative, would you, was it? So basically the rule is, yeah, so the rule is that if, it is going in the same direction in V1 and the inferior leads, then it is not typical flutter. So what you typically will see is that V1 and 2, 3 and AVF will be opposite each other if it is a CTI dependent flutter. So you'll see the sawtooth pattern in 2, 3 and AVF, and then you'll see something that looks like P waves in V1 or vice versa. But in this particular situation, you kind of saw things that looked like P waves in both of those. Yeah. So basically it's more consistent with an atypical flutter. Atypical, yeah. Is, is there also that maybe when you look at like your typical flutter on your 12 lead ECG, the flutter waves are pretty much consistent in terms of morphology in all the leads um, compared to a left sided one, which you show some variation in the morphology. Uh, maybe more similar to uh, AF. AF will look also different compared on, on the 12 lead compared to your typical flutter. The flutter waves tend to be quite similar. Is that, is that right? Is that... Well, the flutter waves, so in a CTI dependent flutter, no, you don't typically see flutter waves in all the leads. Like, yeah. So typically, uh, in, I mean, in terms of I the morphology, is... the size, like, so like more, much more similar than atrof, AF. AF, you get some like really tiny morphology. Like, oh, yeah. So, in AF, side, yeah. Yeah, so the whole like, idea behind AF, right, is that, you know, with atrial fibrillation is not concerted activity. Yeah. So you, you expect to see that variation. So sometimes you think that you're seeing flutter, but then you notice that, you know what, it's not the same in every beat, right? In that same lead. But for... Typical, for atrial flutter, right? Whether it's typical or atypical, every P wave, F wave, whatever you wanna call it, the, the atrial activation will look the same in that same lead, right? Mm -hmm. It might not look the same when you compare lead one and lead ABF but it will look the same in that same lead. So that's the reason why you have the rhythm strip at the bottom of the EKG, right? Mm -hmm. The V1, when you walk it across, all those P waves or the atrial activation will look the same regardless, right? Versus if you look at a fib, each beat will look different. If there is a beat for an um, electrical activation for you to see. So there's sometimes when you look at an EKG and you're thinking to yourself, is this AFib or is it atrial flutter? If it's atrial fib, it's not going to look the same for each same. beat. There's going to be variation in each beat. In atrial flutter, there's no variation in each complex. Every electrical activation will look the same. Now, it's not going to look the same in each different lead. So lead V1 is not going to look the same as 2, 3, and AVF. Typically, <coughs> Typically, the inferior leads will look similar 
the lateral leads will look similar, things like that. Um, so if it was like a um, left-sided atrial tachy, in fact, when you brought that ECG, I was thinking that could be left-sided atrial tachy, apart from the cycle length, which is about almost run about 300 milliseconds, 300 beats per minute, um, which, which obviously led me to think it was flatter more than anything. Um, the cycle length was about that. Um, so could that, because I thought it was atrial, atrial, left-sided atrial tachy. I, I was just guessing, obviously. <laughs> so one thing is the cycle length for sure, you know, but the second thing is when you're, when you're talking about atrial tach, <laughs> what you're saying is that the atrium, it's all squeezing together. And remember that your P wave is basically saying what the entire atrium is doing, right? It's, it's telling you about your atrial contraction and what your atrial contraction is able to do. So whenever your atrium is able to contract in unison, typically your P wave is a little bit bigger, right? Than if you are not able to. So when you have atrial flutter, is the entire atrium moving? Yeah-ish, but if it's so fast, it's really not moving that much. And you can see it on echo, right? Where you see, you know, the right side moving, but the left side is not necessarily moving as much. Um, so you just kind of have to think about that. The second thing though, is that um, atrial tachycardias, um, because the P wave has to be so big, usually it's not going to be, the, the actual P wave is going to be greater than a certain number. So when you see a very thin uh, P wave, it's unlikely that it's going to be an atrial tach okay. because you need like an entire area to squeeze. Similar to, think of it like this, like when you have LVH, right? Versus when you have a, a normal a ventricle that's typical, right? Mm -hmm. um, the reason why you have LVH is because you, you are um, incorporating all the molecules in the left ventricle. So even though it is, it's talking about the electrical activity, but it also bears in mind, like you, you're also taking into account the mass of the left ventricle and the number of cells that you have that are involved in this concerted movement that will give you that huge voltage. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing with the atrium, right? That if you have the entire atrium involved in this concerted you know, voltage and this concerted movement, you'd expect to see a higher voltage, you'd expect it to be a certain amount, um, you'd expect the P wave to be a certain width um, and depending on where it's coming from, you know, it's going to involve a certain area under the curve kind of thing. So it's not just how fast it is, which is an important thing. The other thing is also how much of the atrium is actually involved in the motion. Brilliant. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Jared, I, I know you had a question for us. Yes, thanks, mate. Um, great talk. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. I'll keep this quick because I'm wary of time. More of a MythBuster question, really. Um, is aspirin good at preventing stroke? Because there seems to be this misconception in the general public that you hear a lot saying, "Oh, yeah, I'm taking prophylactic aspirin because I don't want to have a stroke." I mean, <laughs> we know it's we know it's used a lot in PCIs and things like that. But uh, just want to can you confirm the myth? Honestly, like, so everybody now agrees that, you know, there are a few drugs that did not go through clinical trials before people started doing them. And if they did, the clinical trials would have failed woefully, <laughs> one of which is aspirin. Aspirin is that great drug that, you know, everybody just takes to prevent everything, but it doesn't, unfortunately, it just, if you don't have the risk factors, it just increases your risk for a GI bleed. That's pretty much all it does. So that's where that's where I stand with that. I think you you're better preventing your 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 you have better luck preventing stroke, taking care of your risk factors, which are you know going to your physician, taking care of your blood pressure, you know all those things, rather than yeah. taking aspirin that kid. Fantastic. Myth busted. Like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good question. All right. All right.
That's great. Um, so if there's nothing immediately pressing, I'll jump into this quiz really quick. Uh, Dr. Joma, this was amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time and you know no the problem. insight has been invaluable. So no problem. I will give you back hosting. Yeah, I can I'll just steal it back from you. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> I sign right, in under Joel. Everyone. So I really appreciate it. No, that was that was awesome. So I appreciate that, everyone. So we do have these quizzes. I'm not sure if everyone has seen them yet. Here is the, um, but we're going to just start doing these weekly uh, disclosures. I feel like I probably should disclose um, that I do work for Abbott. So you're going to get a lot of Abbott bias out of me, especially when it comes to the learning material, just because this is what I have access to. We're working with our friends in Medtronic to uh, to get some access to quizzes and additional education, but I just want to give you a heads up ahead of time. So. Let's take a look here. Um, so the first question we had this ask is, um, what, what's the lead sequence of pacing? So does anyone want to jump in and interpret this? This is a biventricular pacemaker, and it's asking which chamber is pacing which? Or the sequence Hello, of that. How are you doing? Yes, sir, Elvis. How are you doing? <laughs> doing well, man. Uh, Good to hear from you. A, a quick guy will have seen the answers below. <laughs> We're going to hide however, the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> however, I, I, uh, what I wrote down was, um, I think I was right, left to right on the uh, A, uh, right to left, and then C is synchronous. Uh, yep. Left to right, in the, uh, the, the, the down um, pool, the way it is like an inverted L. So that's the left going to the right, and then to C, which is the L itself, the right was left. And mm -hmm. Yep. So exactly. So if if you see this little this little guy pointing to the left, that means the left side is pacing first. Now it won't actually tell you the offsets. So you can't measure how long this is, but um, that'll just tell you that there is an earlier left activation. Um, this will be it's going to be pacing the right first, and then the left, and then together will be simultaneous. If it's just one chamber, you will just see VP as in ventricular pace. So we kind of covered these last week, but just to remember, or just to refresh people's memory, the thicker black line are absolute refractory periods. The thinner lines are relative refractory periods where the device can see events. It just doesn't respond to them. And then this part of the tree is atrial. The bottom half of the tree is going to be your ventricular blanking. These are going to be your timings, A to A timing. This will be your A to V timing. And finally, your V to V timing. So. Great work there. I'll go ahead and hold here. So if people are on YouTube, they can pause the screen and take a look at the explanation. And that should be long enough to pause. All right. What about this one? What are we seeing here? Yep. Oh, okay. Ignore what I just showed you. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, I don't know if someone else on the try, but let me give my, uh, give my opinion. It looks like uh, in the first uh, box, it looks like uh, oh, this is different. Uh, what, you, what you're showing me now, what the question was, there was no T wave indicator on the previous one. Anyway, I, I thought it was perhaps a, a T wave, a retrograde mm -hmm. T wave, and that fell into the absolute refractory period. And so it's Sort of the set the time, and then the actual ascent that should have um, been triggered was not as well triggered. Right? That's what I see. So that's what I that's what I see. I mean, I yeah. No. So you're totally right. Uh, in the original test question, it didn't actually point to it and say T wave. So this was added on. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing a ventricular pace. You're seeing a T wave, and you can see a little bit of it on the far field. You can definitely see a, like a little notch on the near field. And the device, you see this little dash here. This means that this event, I can, we'll get into it in later conversations, but what it's basically saying is there's a disagreement between the interval average or the average of the last uh, total four events and this current interval, as in this current interval would be considered a fast event to the device. So when you have this kind of argument of is it fast or is it slow, it puts a little hyphen. But one thing to just recognize here is this is a V sense. It's technically a VS, 
that the device picked up. But then if you look at your far field channel, your discriminator channel, which is your coil to can vector, which is a, a far field, you'd see that there's no depolarization. Could this be isoelectric? Yeah, sure. But it's it's T-wave over sensing. You can, you can pretty much see in this case. So basically we're looking at the far field. We don't see a corresponding far field event occur. We do see a slight notch here on the vSense amp, which is what the device is actually looking at. The device then says, okay, I see something in the near field. I don't see something in the far field. If there had been something, you would see another VS2 right here. So it says, okay, there's a disagreement. So I'm going to label it as non-sustained RV over sensing or T-wave over sensing. You would eventually get an EGM that says um, like non-sustained NSROV, so non-sustained RV over sensing. Um, in this case, you're exactly right. This is the true ventricular event that comes across. And um, this is marked as another hyphen because this interval and this interval are still considered fast. Um, you can see the corresponding ventricular event occur, so we know that's true. And then you, there is an atrial event detected, but because it fell into a relative refractory of that atrial channel, it fell into this guy right here after the ventricular event, it marks it as a um, A in refractory. And in defibrillators, it puts just a dash. If this was a uh, pacemaker, you would have an AR. But in our, our defibrillators, it puts a dash. So that's exactly what's occurring. I'll scroll down so you can pause and read what, uh, what uh, Matthew Fiebig, the uh, man who put this together, what he had to say about it. Any questions while I'm hovering here, though, at all about what you're seeing? AJ, no questions. But no questions. You post, you post it for for yeah. photos. Look, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll send this out to the chat as well, um, and then you can also yeah. obviously review the description on um, on YouTube. Not so. not sure whether it's coincidental, exactly. AJ, or but um, whether you only seem to be perhaps it's just this one little snapshot. But you only be seeing T wave ever sensing during V pacing, not V sensing, but whether that's a repolarization or deep the way the heart's depolarizing with pacing rather than intrinsic depolarization, maybe. That, that is a really good point. Um, yes. And what's interesting too, is this is a single chamber device um, or not a single chamber. It's a, um, it only has one lead in the, in the RV. It doesn't have a bi -V. Um, What you'll see a lot of times is bi -Vs where um, if we don't properly capture, say we're not capturing in the LV, you may have a wider depolarization. Um, and that can lead to T-wave oversensing. So non-capture in the LV is a big factor in bivies having T-wave oversensing. Um, trying to think what other factors. I mean, it could be chemical, you know, anything like that. But just to keep that uh, keep that in mind, it's a really good point. Is it's after a V-pace and it doesn't occur all the time. Right. Um, another yeah. thing you can kind of look at is morphologically, this isn't a great example here, but you could almost argue that there's a chance that we are fusing here. Because the morphology, once again, we don't have a true EKG, that would really show us. But is this is obviously a PBC, right? Morphologically, it looks completely different from the intrinsic events. But this looks pretty similar to the intrinsic. And you could argue, are we fusing? Possibly. Um, or are we non-capturing in the RV entirely and just kind of pacing? And that's leading to T-wave oversensing. Because to your point, the... Um, the total uh, refractoriness or the sensitivity of the device changes and on whether or not we're sensing or pacing. So if we're not actually pacing, then it's going to affect our ability to, uh, to determine. That was awesome. I appreciate your input there. Okay. This one's fun. Um, Elvis, you will see this in the IVH area. I'm pretty certain. Uh, do you want to take a crack at why we're pacing above the base rate? Anybody though? I think it's due to the rich response feature. Uh, okay. So you would absolutely be correct if we saw an SIR here. And that is the first thing that everybody's mind goes to. Completely right. It would be rare response. However, there's something else at play. Does anyone else want to take a shot? If not, I can jump into it. Okay. So, um, no, I, you're totally right. Your instincts are right, saying rate response, because why are we um, why are we pacing faster? And DDIR is a huge cue of that, right? We do have a sensor, so that's why I would pace faster than the base rate. However, in this case, our devices, uh, I don't know if it's shown here. It's not. Um, 
our device will have an SIR on the marker channel, channel to, 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 to uh, say uh, it's a say sensor it's... indicated rate, or we're pacing um, based on the sensor's indication. However, that's not activated right now. What's actually happening is it's an idiosyncrasy of V to V timing. So if you think about uh, DDIR, this is a ventricular based timing cycle. And the way that that works is it knows when to restart the cycle based on the V to A timing. So let's see if they have a decent description here. I wish I could calculate this out for you. I don't know if I can draw it or not. Let's see. Okay. Nope, I can't. I give up. All right. I was going to try to draw this for you, but it's not letting me mark it up. Um, but basically what the way this is occurring, the way it figures out your, your, sorry. Yes, sir. Pen from the zoom. Yeah. You can use a pen from the zoom. Normally I can. Oh, here it is. Look at you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Will it work is a question. Okay. Ignore that one though. Um, okay. So with normal ventricular base timing, it's not drawing for me. Um, or with normal atrial base timing, it's going to just do your 8A timing is just going to be a, a, a constant of say, in this case, um, 800 milliseconds, right? That's what we're going to do normally. <laughs> I really should have a mouse for this. Um, but ventricular based timing, what it's actually looking at is it's the time between the V and the A would be the 800 milliseconds minus the AV delay, which in this case is programmed to 200 to 350 milliseconds, I want to say. So you have 350. Looks like our math is down here. Um, plus 450 equals 800. Right, that's the that's the standard setup. Three hundred and fifty plus four hundred and fifty is eight hundred. So it knows to pace the atrium four hundred and fifty milliseconds after a ventricular event. However, in ventricular based timing, if they conduct before the AV delay times out, before that three hundred and fifty milliseconds, it then still adds four hundred and fifty to the ventricular event, and that's when the atrial pace occurs. Right. So if you're conducting in DDIR it's going to be pacing above the base rate because it's only adding 450 to the ventricular um, timing. So in this case, the AV delay, is the actual AV delay of this patient because they conduct is around 240. The V to A timing is 450 milliseconds. 240 plus 480 is less than 800 at 690 milliseconds, which is why we pace at 87. Um, this doesn't really matter all that much. I would argue a lot of times, except you might get a call from the nursing staff saying, why is this patient programmed at 60, but they're going, you know, 75 beats a minute, not the biggest deal. However, it is an idiosyncrasy of, um, devices that if you have the sensor running, you can technically pace above the sensor, uh, restricted rate. So in this case, let me get out of here. Um, we set our sensor, <clears throat> Our max sensor rate was 105. Because of this idiosyncrasy of timing, we could be pacing well above 105 beats a minute because the sensor-driven rate with a long AV delay in taking that into account could mean that we pace at like 130, 140, 150 beats a minute, which can not, could be not ideal for a patient. So one thing to keep in mind is if you're going to be setting extremely long AV delays in patients programmed DDIR, um, you... I guess you don't want to do that. <laughs> in patients DDIR, you don't want to have extremely long AV delays because of the chance, if they have conduction, that they could pace above the base rate. Um, that's why a lot of devices that I will program their mode switch rate or their AMS base rate to VVIR, um, because I know that you know if we're trying to allow it to conduct, we could pace them faster than they need to. Does that make sense to everybody, what I just said? Yeah, it's nice, man. It's kind of a weird thing. You won't see it much, but you will see it. Maybe one for Elvis. What do you think's happening in the atrial channel? Oh. Okay. Uh, I think there's um, um, we have an overtensing of the ventricular activity. It's sensing it, but it's not. Uh, they sense they're sensing of the ventricular activity in the internal, but it's not taking note of it. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's being right. blanked. Yeah. Blank, yes. Yeah. So you can see that the PVARP is occurring here. Our blanking is properly programmed to blank out this event. If it wasn't properly programmed, then we run the risk of oversensing. I don't know if I can get rid of this already. Any questions here? I'm going to try to clear this out. Okay, it's not clearing. Yeah, there we go. We'll save that here so people can pause it, but that's the explanation. Any, th any other questions or anything else anyone wants to ask before we uh, hop off the call? No, that's right, I appreciate it, Tom. Yeah. I appreciate everybody uh, jumping on. This is a, it's a great, great talk. Well, thank, thank you again for Dr.